Good evening, friends. Welcome to St. Anne's Episcopal Church and the second of our community faith conversations. Um, tonight we are joined by Miss Mary Kloss from the Society of Friends. Uh, community Faith Conversations is a cooperative effort between St. Anne's Episcopal Church and an organization known as GIFT, which is growing in faith together. Um, GIFT is a group of 20 faith communities in the greater Green Bay area that have been providing interfaith worship opportunities for Thanksgiving and Martin Luther King Jr. Day for the last 15 years. And so we are happy to partner with them for these events. Uh, please know that each second Tuesday of the month through March, we will be having a community faith conversation Next month, on November the 9th, we are joined by Jody Figgins, who will be talking to us about Buddhism. Um, it'll be the same bat time, the same bat channel right here at St. Anne's. So uh, please feel free to join us again then and invite your friends to come with you. I checked with you before we started. Everyone has your uh, authorized question cards and your authorized number two pencils for marking in your answers. Uh, so uh, as, as Mary speaks to us about her tradition, please feel free to jot down some questions that we'll then collect and, uh, and have Mary take a look at when we reach that point of tonight's program. Also, for those joining us via the magic of the internet, you may also list your questions inside of the chat window, and we will get those questions passed up as well. So don't be shy just because you're out there in TV land. We will make sure that you can participate as fully as possible. To introduce tonight's speaker, Miss Mary Claus has been a member of the Religious Society of Friends for the last 30 years. She is currently the clerk of Fox Valley Friends Meeting, the local Quaker meeting, and she is active in religious education for children and prison ministry. So without any further ado, Mary, would you please come forward? Well, I wanna thank you all for being here tonight. I just love the idea of sharing our faith traditions with each other because like we've said many times, we have so much in common and it's nice to learn that. So I guess I'm going to talk to you tonight about the Quakers. We're actually called the Religious Society of Friends. Among ourselves, we usually call each other Friends with a capital F, but you'll hear a story later about how we got the name Quakers and I guess when most people hear about Quakers, this is what they think of, the Quaker Oats box. That's why I put it up there. That's what I used to think of as Quakers. When you think of them wearing the old black clothes and all of that, that did happen at one time in the United States. And the interesting story about why, why is it a Quaker Oats company? No Quakers are involved in the Quaker Oats company. But at the time that they started selling this oatmeal, Quakers had a reputation for always selling products at a fair price. Before that, a lot of products were sold like, you know, you'd barter for it, and they'd take as much as they could get from you. <clears throat> and one of the Quaker values is equality. And they believed that, you know, if whatever's the fair price for one person should be a fair price for the other person. And so they were some of the first people to start like putting prices on their things. So they had this reputation for being, you know, fair priced, good quality. And so this oats company decided to use them as their brand. Since then, the Quaker organization has sent delegations and letters to the Quaker Oats Company asking them to please stop using 
our name for their product, but they haven't really listened to us. So that's the story about that. So I guess what we're going to talk about tonight, I'll tell you about how we, that we began the Religious Society of Friends. And then I'll talk to you about what our faith is and what our practices are. And then we'll actually have a worship sharing experience together where you'll get to experience what it's like to do one of our types of prayer services. Then I can talk a little bit about history, long or short, depending on how much time we have left. And then we'll have the questions at the end. So how did we begin? The beginning was from this man named George Fox, who lived in England in the 1600s. And as a young man, maybe late teens, early 20s, he was very disillusioned with the Church of England. He just felt like it didn't speak to him, it didn't nurture him spiritually. He spent a lot of years sort of roaming the countryside, visiting different churches and places and people, trying to find what the truth was for what his spiritual faith should be based on. And at one point he was sitting somewhere in the countryside and sort of had this revelation from God that told him, and this is, there is one, even Christ Jesus, that can speak to thy condition. And when I heard it, my heart did leap for joy. Doesn't mean much today, but that's the words of their time, but what he meant was, he heard within himself God speaking to him and telling him that he didn't need to go find a church or a teacher or anyone else. If he just sat there still and listened, there was that of God inside of him that he could connect with directly. He didn't have to have a preacher or a pastor connecting him to God. He could do it himself. And that was the revelation to him that brought him so much joy. And he was so excited about it, he started going out and uh, teaching other people that they could do that too. And in fact, I was talking to Deacon Mary Lynn before, this is an Episcopal church, sort of way back, comes from the Church of England. This is the Church of England, churches like this would be having their services. And George Fox was a very charismatic person and he'd stand outside and he'd start preaching outside and gathering crowds of people listening to him, telling them, well, they didn't need to go in church and have a preacher or a pastor tell them what to do. They could just you know, gather together and, and, and have a direct experience. So you can imagine that didn't make him real popular with, with the institutions there. He got arrested a lot. He got a lot of followers, but a lot of them got arrested quite frequently. And then this is, oh, it was working so well. Oh, there we go. Okay. This is where our name Quakers came from. There's during one of the trials he was in, and he had many trials. He was thrown in jail many times. And there was a Judge Bennett there who was putting him on trial for preaching. And George Fox said to him, you should tremble at the word of God. And the judge thought that was just hilarious that this man was telling him he should tremble. So from then on, he started calling George Fox and all of his friends Quakers, because they quake and tremble before God. Somehow that nickname stuck from that one incident and we've been known as Quakers ever since. One of the very interesting things about his direct experience of God and his belief that there's that of God in every person is that it leads to a peace testimony that uh, you might have heard that Quakers believe in peace and not fighting and not war to solve differences. And in fact, at the time, he specifically was asked to take up arms for the Commonwealth against Charles Stewart. And he replied with these words, I know from whence all wars arise, and I live in the virtue of that life and power that takes away the occasion of all war. He just said, I'm going to live in a way that there's no need to have war. We're gonna work things out and I refuse to fight. And that was a very risky thing to do at that time too, to refuse to, refuse to fight in the army when you were asked. Another reason that they got arrested 
and sent to jail. Although was, he didn't get arrested for that particular one, and I was really surprised by that. But in any event, that's uh, what how it all started. But of course, one person going around preaching can't really get an organization started. So this is where another woman named Margaret Fell really came into the picture. She helped him get everything organized. And he was in the habit of, like I said, going in old front of churches, just wandering around England, stopping at different places, at houses, wherever he was invited. And he would go in, and he did this uh, to Margaret, Margaret Fell's home. He'd say, she invited him in because she had heard about him. She said, let's have a prayer service. So he said, okay, set up all of your dining room chairs in your parlor, put them all in a circle. So everyone's equal. There's no head. We're all equal. And invite all of your servants to join you because we're all equal. We all have that of God in us. There's no reason to separate anyone out. So she invited her family and all of her servants in, and they sat in the circle, and they sit in silence. And they wait for what God might be, what message he might be trying to give them. And if they have a, feel they have a message, then they speak it and share it with the rest of the group. But everyone's on an equal footing. And that was pretty amazing to the people at that time where class was so much a part of their daily life. Well, George Fox went on his way, but Margaret Fell was really, um, uh, really believed that this was the way that she wanted to practice her faith. So she started organizing. She started writing letters to the different communities that were starting to develop, uh, I guess, friends, churches in different places. But for the most part, they were just in people's homes. But so many people were being arrested that that left women and children who needed to be taken care of. So a lot of their organizing work was around how do we get support to these women and children to help them while their father's in jail because he was arrested for his Quaker beliefs. So that got a lot of things um, organized. And then having to spend time in prison, a lot of Quakers came out saying, boy, things are bad in prison. This isn't the way people should be treated. So then they started a lot of work on prison reform. Um, Margaret was married to a judge a judge fell, and he was one of those circuit judges that would spend long time out on his circuit going from town to town hearing cases. And he came back. She ran the household. He came back. He was totally supportive of George Fox and what he believed to when he supported his wife. But he died earlier, and Margaret lived longer. And eventually, after many, after 11 years, Margaret Fell did marry a George Fox. So they always worked work together well, but she really helped organize it and get started. There's another example of how women and men have always been equal from their very beginnings within the Quaker religion. This picture shows Swarthmore Hall, which is the home that Margaret Fell lived in. And you might have heard of Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, and it's named after this place. So there's actually different kinds of Quakers now. This shows how we all started as one, but then over time, we split into these different groups, and I, won't even, I don't know that I even know all the history of why one group didn't get along and wanted to be different, but whatever. In the end now, we're in different groups, which are, to me, basically split between unprogrammed and programmed. And the important thing about that is we practice in a very different way. Unprogrammed is what we are here in the Green Bay area. Unprogrammed means we meet together in silence for an hour and just wait on the Lord to hear what messages he might want us to share with each other. A program meeting is more like this or any other typical church. They hire a pastor, they have a prayer service, they do things that way. And then there's this little tiny group of conservatives and uh, and it's not conservative in the sense of conservative and liberal politics like we think of now. It's conservative in the sense that they wanted to stick to the way the early Quakers did things. So they're actually pretty liberal. But in, there's a group of them in Iowa. That's the closest I know of. But you can see that uh, they're spread in all different countries. But we're, we're still a pretty small group. 
Um, you can look at our numbers. There's only 153,000 of us in all the Americas, North America and South America. The largest place with the, I mean, the place with the most Quakers is Africa, with 156,000, especially in Kenya. Apparently, there were some Quaker missionaries that really got it started there. And, and you know, anywhere in the world that you go, you can usually find a Quaker meeting that's usually pretty small. So now I'll talk a bit about what is it that we believe, that Quakers say we believe. And probably the one thing that's the hardest to, or that makes us the most different, I think, is that we have no creed, where most religions have a creed. We use, the creed is what you all agree to believe. And we do not have one of those in Quakers. So people say, well, if you don't have it written down what you all believe, what is it that keeps you all together? What makes you, you know, on the same page? And after much discussion over many, many years, it basically comes down to the fact that we all believe we are seekers. We are all seeking that truth that God wants us to know. And we believe in continuing revelation of that truth. We believe that God's truth is sort of larger and greater than any one of us can understand. And each of us try, but we'll never quite get there that as time goes on, as history goes on, we learn more and we get closer and closer to the God's truth, which means some things might change. What you believed 100 years ago might not be what you believe now. An example is slavery. Early Quakers had slaves. Later on, Quakers said, no, that's not right. So that's what we believe in, continuing revelation. And the example is this picture. You've heard the story. There's an elephant, which represents like the great truth that's out there. And all the men are blind. And how are they going to know what this elephant really is? They can each only touch one part, the trunk or the tail or the leg. They all feel and look different. Only by talking to each other and sharing their experiences do we start to come to some realization of what that greater truth is? So that's what we try to do when we're sitting there in silence and waiting. If each of us gets some message based on like the experiences we've had and our deep searching within our souls and communicating with God directly within us, if that leads us to some learning, then we share that, we speak that with each other. And by listening to each other, we slowly build up our understanding of the truth. But one thing we definitely believe is that there is that of God in everyone. We tend to call it the inner light. Every, every person has it. There's no person that is godless or without God within them. Every person can connect to God within them. And of, I guess even with all this, with no creed, having these things, you still get to those times in life where you have to make a decision about something. Is what you're doing right or not right? What should you do? So what do Quakers do to answer that question when those times come? We kind of have several different methods we do. We, what we think our actions should be, what we think we're being called to do, that's called our leading. So we might take those leadings and we might read the Bible and look for answers in the Bible to whether this is the right path for us. Or we might look at other sacred texts. We'll look at anything that was written with you know, deep spiritual discernment. Or we might go to Quaker elders or other Quakers that we know and talk to them about it. And by using all those methods, we come to uh, clarity, I guess, on whatever question it is we're trying to answer. So this is how we're organized. And you might wonder, we're called like Fox Valley Friends Meeting. We never call ourselves a church because the reason being that George Fox said, the church doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what building you're in. What matters is the people and you're being gathered together and worshiping with, you know, together under God's name. So we're called Meetings with a capital M. And we're organized locally. So we have a local meeting here in Fox Valley, and we have our own meetings for worship every Sunday morning. And then once a month or so, we have a meeting for business. We actually call it meeting for worship 
with attention to business because we believe that business is just sort of the extension of what God wants us to do. And we want to do it in a worshipful way. Then those monthly meetings, and within Wisconsin, there's maybe oh, 10 or 15 of them. If you think of all the different big cities, most of the cities have a Quaker monthly meeting. But once a year, we'll get together and we're in what's called a yearly meeting. So that group's called a yearly meeting. We're part of Northern Yearly Meeting, which brings together Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Now, here's to me the really fascinating thing, is you have to have some sort of written down, what do we believe, what do we do? And we have one, it's, and every Quaker meeting has one. They're called faith and practice. What's our faith? How do we practice it? Every yearly meeting develops one of these. Now, Northern Yearly Meeting is fairly new. We've only been around about 30 years. We had to write our own book of what we believe and how we're going to practice it because there's no one at the top telling everyone what to do. It's coming from the bottom up. So, how, so when this book was written, it was written chapter by chapter, like there's a chapter on honesty. People wrote it, they sent it to every monthly meeting. Those monthly meetings had to review it, send back their comments, and then they would rewrite it and go back and forth and back and forth until finally the yearly meeting would approve it. And we don't have representatives at the yearly meeting. The yearly meeting is everybody. Every Quaker is essentially a minister, has no one in between them. And you know, there's, there's no hierarchy. Everyone's equal. We're all ministers. We're all responsible for ourselves. We're all responsible for working with each other. So I'm pretty proud of this faith and practice. It took 20 years to write this, but it kind of tells the things that we all agree to that we're trying to do together to live a, a spiritual life. So what kind of things are in there? We have things called testimonies that most Quakers tend to believe. And, and there's basically five of them. And you can see these, if you look at the first letter, it spells out spice. That's how we remember them. So S, simplicity. Simplicity is what people think of, like, you know, you're Amish, you don't use electricity, the simple life, that's why you wear those black clothes, like what's on the Quaker Oats box. But that's not really what simplicity means to us, because many of our people use technology, drive cars, do all those things. We use all those things. But simplicity means that you sort of uh, narrow down the things you focus on in your life to only focus on those things that are really important, like your relationship with God and your relationship with others, and try to get everything that's extraneous out. So the level of technology you have doesn't really matter, but are you focusing on what's most important and what God wants you to do? That's simplicity. The next one that I talked a bit about is peace, that we believe that there is no reason to fight with each other, there is no reason to kill each other, there's no reason for war, that we all have God within us, why would we kill that of God in another person? Now that said, there's still differences of individually about what, I mean, some people supported World War II because they felt it was a good cause and it needed to be done. Others did not. So it's sort of an individual decision where you draw the line on that. But in general, we believe in peace. One story I really like to share is that um, even though many Quakers did not serve in World War II, they by fighting, they served in other ways. And one of the ways was that uh, the government was doing experiments, well, I don't just say experiments, tests. They knew that when the soldiers came back from some of the prison camps in the Philippines and places, they would have been very starved. They would have undergone a lot of starvation. And they wanted to learn how to bring them back to health as quickly as possible. So they had many Quaker volunteers, instead of doing military service, volunteered to be test subjects and were essentially starved and then brought back to health under different methods so they could learn what worked the best. While those men were doing that, their families all gathered in St. Paul, Minnesota to support each other. And the friends meeting in St. Paul actually came from all those people that were gathered together to support 
those men in those starvation experiments. So there's a lot of different ways to serve. I'd say the third uh, one is integrity. And by integrity, we mean that what you show on the outside is the same as what's inside of you, that there's no duplicity. You are, you know, what you are is what you show people and how you act. You don't act one way in one situation and a different way in another. It's very challenging. I try hard, but it's, it's one of our goals that we all work toward or strive towards. And the third one is community, that we need to be in community with each other. We need to do things together. And then the fourth is equality. Like I said, um, women have been equal to men from the beginning. The different um, nationalities, races, religions, all, all equal. So those are our testimonies. And just a few other interesting things that are different about us is that we do not have any sacraments. We don't have any special holy days. And that's because we believe all acts and all days are holy. Everyone is a gift from God. No one is better than any other. So we celebrate them all. Now, in practice, many of us who live here in the United States, we do celebrate Christmas and Easter as a cultural thing with our families. But from the standpoint of our church and our faith, when we meet on those days, we worship the same way we'd worship every other day. Another thing we have, which is a little different, is we have called clearness committees. If you are struggling with something in your life, you're not quite sure what to do or where you should go or how you should approach something and you want some sort of spiritual guidance or support, you ask for a clearness committee and there will be several people from the meeting who will join with you and just meet with you and, and listen to your, you know, whatever issues you're having and help you sort that out. What I really like about the clearness committees is the, it's a very safe place to go to get support because what they're there to do is to listen to you and ask you questions, ask you questions to help clarify your thinking so that you get clear about what it is you think you should do. They're not giving you advice or telling you what you should do. They're just asking questions and help you through. And I've used clearness committees several times and it's been very helpful. Then the other thing that's a little different is because we don't have this creed, we don't have these things we believe that we can say together as prayers, what we do have instead are queries, which are questions. So instead of like saying the answer and saying, we all agree this is the answer, we just pose questions. And then we all think about what our answers to that would be. And what is God telling us the answer to that should be? And what do our experiences tell us the answer to that should be? And we share our answers with each other, and we all help each other learn in that way. You can do those individually, yourself, as a spiritual practice, or you can do them together in a group. And when we do it together in a group, we call that worship sharing. So that's what we're going to tr uh, do tonight together, give you a chance to have a worship sharing experience So first, I'll just tell you how that's going to work, and then we'll and then we'll do it. So we're actually going to ask you to form small groups. Maybe it looks like we can just have three or four people here tonight, just get together. So that when we're ready to start, we'll probably ask you to kind of gather together in little groups. When you get in your group, pick out someone to be your leader. Your leader doesn't have to do much except tell the group when to start and stop but it's just to keep things a little organized. You don't just all sit there staring at each other. So get a leader and the group leader will read the query. And I'm gonna show you the query on the next slide. So the leader reads the query to the group. And then you just take a few minutes in silence to individually consider what your answer to that query would be from your experiences and what you know, um, what you believe, what's your answer? And then after a few, a minute or two of silence, then the group leader can start and just share their answer with the rest of the group. And then you go around the circle clockwise and you let each person share their response. Now here's the really hard part. After each person says what they want to say, do their sharing, just leave a little bit of silence. You don't, 
You don't say anything back. You don't, you don't give a response to what they said because they're just sharing their experience. You're just listening. And then leave a little silence to think about what they said. And uh, just, you know, it's, it's hard not to discuss things because we're so geared to discussing things, but this isn't discussing, this is just listening. And if it is your turn and you really don't want to share, you can just say pass. I mean, there's no obligation. Don't feel, don't feel bad about that if, it's, if you don't want to share. And then once you've gone around the circle and everyone's spoken, then you just take another minute of silence to think about everything you just heard, what you can learn from that. And then the group leader will just stand up and you'll all hold hands. And that's how you end your worship. Um, your worship. So are people willing to give that a try? So, okay, so if you could just, I can show you what the query is going to be. And this was taken right from our faith and practice from our chapter on equality. There is diversity among God's children. How can I respond with interest and respect to those who are different from me and my values? Oh, now if you wanna get into small groups of three or four, give it a try. Oh, good.
English admiral that spent a lot of money on the Navy to support one of the kings. And in return, the king was supposed to pay him back. The king didn't have enough money, so instead the king said, you know what, I'll give you this big piece of land over in America. You can have that. It's yours now. And Admiral Penn gave it to his son. His son had become a Quaker. He had heard George Fox and other people and was very excited by um, Quakerism and what it had to offer. And so he said, I'm going to take this new land in Pennsylvania and I'm going to turn it into a holy experiment. We're going to go there or we're going to start building this whole society based on our Quaker values. Well, they tried. One of the things they did is that they wrote treaties with the First Nation people that were there, treated them a bit more fairly than some of the other Englishmen did. Although I have to say last night, talking about continuing revelation, someone just came out with a study that, you know what? William Penn didn't really treat them all that well. His treaties were actually, I'm here now, this is gonna be my land, this is how you're gonna have to act, sign here. And uh, he, they said that George Fox, who traveled in America at that time, and Benjamin Franklin were actually both much more respectful of the First Nation people and their sovereignty than William Penn never was. But I just read this last night, so I just thought I had to share that instead of just spreading the, the message we have from the history books that William Penn was, was this great, uh, um, had great respect for the Indians. He had a little respect, but not as much as he should have. And we all are familiar with that. And there's this painting of William Penn signing the treaty. That was actually done many years later by Quakers who wanted to show that they were good friends to the Native Americans. So they commissioned someone to make that painting. So it really isn't related to what happened. It was, it was a propaganda piece made later. In any event, the other thing I want to tell you about William Penn, which I thought was really interesting, he did do many writings. He, you know, he was a good man and he wrote many uh, sacred te or spiritual texts and things. Um, when he was young, you know, his dad was an admiral. He was young, he was like a soldier and they walk around and they have their swords by their side every day and they like that. But he knew that as a Quaker, he wasn't supposed to go to war or fight. So what he didn't, but he didn't want to give up his sword. So he talked to George Fox about it. And he said, do I have to take off my sword? And this is what George Fox said to him. He said, you wear it as long as thou canst. Which in effect said, you wear that until you are so in tune with wanting to promote peace that you're not gonna feel right wearing it. And then you'll take it off. So that's sort of the way uh, we approach things a lot in Quakerism. Someone might not be doing something quite the way we would like them to be doing it right now, but you know what? We'll just keep praying together, worshiping together, and over time, they'll probably come to, to that right spot. Oh, he's <laughs> I thought I have to point it at that, right? There we go. I wasn't pointing it right. I think I have to lift it up. Okay. Anyway, this is one of my favorite Quaker women. Her name is Mary Dyer. And if you do go to Boston Commons in Boston, you will see this statue there in her memory. She was actually a martyr. If you go back to 1658, when Massachusetts was a colony run by the Puritans, Puritans didn't like having these Quakers around. And so they passed a law that banished all Quakers in the colony. And they said, if you show up in our town, you know, you'll be put to death. We really do not want you here, thinking that would just keep them away. Well, Mary and some of her other friends just didn't think that was right. So they would go walk into Boston and they would get arrested. And there's one story, <laughs> she was arrested and on trial. And, and at least the way the story goes, she was close to being hung. And suddenly her husband shows up and convinces the men that, oh, I'll take her back home, I'll take care of her, you don't have to hang her, you know, so. So they let her go back with her husband. Well, darn it, if the next time he went away, she didn't go back to Boston again. She said, they're not gonna get away with this. And she was just forcing them to actually, you know, do something, which they did. Um, 
and uh, that she, they asked her to leave and since she refused to leave, she said, nay, I cannot for in obedience to the will of the Lord, I came and in his will, I abide faithful unto death. And she did get put to death. And her death was kind of like, it, it pushed them to such an extreme that that was sort of the beginning of the end for them that people thought, you know what, that's a little bit extreme to kill someone just because they walked through your town. So, so she did a lot uh, of good there for religious tolerance. But what's most interesting about that story, I think, is the little community of Quakers she was from that lived nearby. Were, when that happened, they said, we're leaving. They went to Rhode Island. They established what is now Rhode Island. They wrote a constitution for Rhode Island. And in that constitution, it guaranteed religious freedom in their Rhode Island. And that um, constitution was sort of the basis for the constitution that came later for the United States that guaranteed religious freedom. It kind of all came through that path. I thought that was interesting. And then we've got um, a man named John Woolman. And we have the Underground Railroad that a lot of Quakers participated in. John Woolman was a traveling Quaker minister. And what is really wonderful about him is he challenged slavery and slave owners, but in very quiet ways. He was a shopkeeper. And um, someone came to him with a slave and said, I need you shopkeeper to write this bill of sale. And when he got paid to do that, he just didn't feel right about it. So that's what got him into the anti-slavery movement. But the kind of thing he would do, he would walk around the countryside, he'd go visit a Quaker who was a slave owner, and he'd have dinner with them and he'd laugh and talk and they'd have a good time. But meanwhile, the um, slaves who were serving him dinner or the children that were fanning them, when he left, he would give them all a little money and say, here, I'm paying you for your work because you deserve it. So just little things like that to get people's thinking to change. So I'm thinking now, did you want to collect the question cards? I'll go on with one more history story here. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention is continuing revelation. Although we Quakers like to say, oh, we were part of the Underground Railroad and we helped with slavery. Quakers were slave owners for 100 years before they decided that it wasn't right. But they did decide it wasn't right about 100 years before the rest of the country did. So we're just... Uh, we're not always right, but we tend to get places a little bit sooner than others, so. But recently there was a book written, Fit for Freedom, Not for Friendship, where some scholars went back and actually looked at all the records from Quaker meetings in the past and found out that although we were against slavery, we really weren't ready to let the black Americans be our friends. We would take care of their kids, we would build schools for them, but do we want you to live next door to us? And be in our meeting? No, not really. So there's a lot of truth there that we keep trying to pull out so that we're not fooling ourselves. And I don't know if you've heard of Lucretia Mott, but she was a Quaker. She was a female preacher. She went around the country and, and, and preached. And she was anti-slavery and equality for women. So she was a very, very busy lady. Okay, so now I guess... Um, what, I'll go through the questions now. First, what does my daily faith practice look like? Well, I guess I just say prayers like anyone else, I guess. And I try to take times when I just throughout the day, if I feel like I'm getting anxious or something, to just sit back, meditate, breathe. Um, I believe that I'm one of those people where my daily faith, I feel my faith strongest when it's calling me to action. Like I said, I'm in prison ministry. I try to do, uh, do good in the community and help other people. I believe that is part of my prayer and part of doing what, what uh, my faith calls me to do. But we have other people in our um, meeting who are more on the mystical side. We have some who spend 15 minutes a day or more meditating. Um, there's all different ways to do that, but what I, I tend to move towards action personally. The next question is, how do you overcome a sense of shyness about sharing at a meeting? 
It's a good question. I guess within the Quakers, I'll be honest, we don't actually make people talk. Like I just sort of said, each of you should talk. But that's because we only had five minutes. In real life, it would happen over a long amount of time. Like the first times you came, no one would, you know, if you didn't want to talk, no one would expect you to talk or ask you to talk. You could just take your time. Just like um, William Penn with his sword. When you were ready, you'll talk. And, and we have a lot of patience that way. Next question, is one testimony more important than others? I think that's very much a personal decision. We treat them all as equal. And I should say there's some Quakers who believe there's a sixth one, that's sustainability, just taking care of the earth, taking care of your resources. So some have adopted that as another um, testimony and it's sort of growing. So it's very much a personal, personal thing. Oh, here's a good question. What if God does not seem to speak to anyone in the meeting? That happens a lot. I think, I think lots of times he speaks to us, but what we say is, is he speaking to you? Is he giving you a message that you feel you should share? Is he telling you that this is something I want you to share with the group? And, I'll, you know, people are people. Some people are more likely to share. Other people are less likely to share. What we do in our meeting, because we have a lot of people who are quieter, after our one hour of silence is done, then we just do a sharing circle. We'll go around the circle and say, what, you know, what came to you today? What were you praying about today? So that kind of takes the pressure off. We don't have to decide if God told you it was a message to share or not. So that's something we all struggle with all the time. But I, I can say that there have been many times, and I have seen it, where one person will say something during meeting, and later you'll find out that that spoke to someone else in the meeting who was thinking about something or considering it at the time. That happens more often than, uh, than I would expect. I'm very surprised. So I think there is something to it. And it says, how come the Quakers have not grown in numbers? I ask myself that question all the time because I think it's a wonderful way to practice my, my spirituality and faith. But I've, I tend to believe there's many people who don't like to sit for one hour in silence. So. And uh, that's just uh, the, the personal, personal preference. And then uh, do we query until the topic is over, unlimited meeting length? And how do you know if the topic's done? Yeah, I, I put you through a very short, brief uh, um, worship sharing experience. When we usually do it, typically the worship sharing might last for 30 minutes and you might have five people, and then you just wait till you feel like you have something to say, and you can speak more than once, and you don't take turns the way I made, the way I made you take turns, you, you just speak. But that takes a lot of practice to like, feel comfortable that, okay, I, I can speak now, it's my turn. So just to make it simpler, I, I had you all take turns, but um, you can do it for any amount of time, but typically we do it for about 30 minutes so that there's enough time to, for people to keep thinking and to think about what they heard, maybe that will spur something else. So you, you don't discuss it, but it might spur some deeper thinking on your part that you'll then want to share. And how do you know it's done? Um, sometimes there is a leader who will just kind of get a sense that nobody has anything else to say, and they'll call the end of the meeting. Um, or the worship sharing, or sometimes you don't have a leader, and you, it's th these are, these are still difficult for me because I tend to be an organized person. I want to know how this is all going to work. But there's frequently Quakers will just sit until it just everyone feels without talking to each other that we're done, and and, and that's how it goes. So it's, we're pretty flexible. Well then, can a group vote to have a member expelled? Yes, they can. It's called being read out of meeting. And in fact, this got really popular back in uh, the days of the American Revolution. If you read any history books, you'll read that a lot because, and this kind of gets to the problem that William Penn had with Pennsylvania. They wanted it to be a, a Quaker society, 
But then all of a sudden there was, you know, we wanted to get our, we wanted democracy. We wanted freedom from the king. That seemed like a good thing to a lot of Quakers, but yet they, they weren't supposed to fight. So Quakers who wanted to support the revolution very often got read out of their meeting, were expelled as Quakers because they weren't supposed to go to war. So um, they, they kind of got to the point where a lot of Quakers were getting read out of meeting. So then they kind of backed off and they said, hey, you know, we're, we're not doing that anymore. We, today, I've not, I do not know of anyone in modern times that's gotten read out of meeting. What happens more is if there's an issue with someone's behavior, um, they'll have like this clearness committee. They'll sit down with them, a few elders from the church and other people, they'll sit down and they'll just talk through issues and try to resolve it. So um, that's, that's how we do it today. Those were very good questions. All the things I forgot to say, so that's good. <laughs> Mary, yes. We've had one question come in from the internet. Okay. Nancy asks, if the Bible is a sacred text, how is Jesus viewed in your faith and practice? It's viewed differently by each individual Quaker. We have some Quakers who are very, um, I guess, Bible focused, and we have other Quakers who are not. In fact, we hear the term Catholic Quakers and Buddhist Quakers and other kind of Quakers, it's um, like I said, how we split into different groups. Some, some are split that are only Bible centered. Others like the group I am in, we use the Bible a lot. People quote scripture a lot, but we don't believe that's the only sacred text that we need to uh, talk to. And we see Jesus as a great um, example of how we should live and a great teacher. But I guess we don't push people on exactly what do you believe. We let people believe what they do, as long as we all share and let each other, um, you know, treat each other with respect and listen to them. Um, that's pretty much what we do. But you'll find some Quaker groups <clears throat> that are more that where you have to be more Bible-centered. Well, I had a very nice time being able to share my faith with all of you tonight, and I really look forward to the future sessions. I'm planning to come so I can hear more about the other faiths, and then we'll get into our discussions later in winter, which would be very nice. So thank you very much. Thanks uh, to all of you for attending tonight. Uh, again, please pick up one of our brochures on your way out that lays out the schedule for the next two speakers. We have Jody Figgins with us on November the 9th for Buddhism. And then on December the 14th, we will have Dr. Andrew O'Connor from St. Norbert's College speaking to us about Islam. Uh, following tonight's program, we will have a brief reception in the parish hall. So instead of going out the doors to your right, go out the doors of the church back to the left and then go to the right and uh, join us for a reception there. To all of our online visitors, sorry you can't join us for coffee and cake, uh, but we, we hope that you'll join us next time, either online or in person for our next Community Faith Conversation. Thanks again for being here and stick around for some refreshments. Thank you.